what would be considered hits or misses. So we can roll. I will uh, run. There was a couple 40 hits and misses. I think we're all consensus on where we hit or missed. Roll that. Then I'll just go down. You, me, or uh, yeah, you, John, me. All right. I discussed any of the significant ones. All right. Roll the intro. Here we go. Welcome to the Fantasy 40 Podcast. We are back. Myself, Andrew Burke, Matt Walker, and John Dabari. He kind of likes to skip these hit and miss episodes, which uh, is going to be a quick one anyway, so no big deal. We'll have them tomorrow for the uh, week five preview. Right, Rock? Week week six? Oh, my God. I'm, well, that was a shit week five for sure. A lot of bad stuff happened, but. Uh, well, yeah, especially you know for for your Dallas Cowboys, but yeah, forgettable week five. A lot of uncertainty, moving games around, canceling games. The first true COVID impacted week. Not a ton of amazing players. There wasn't a ton of amazing football being played, in in my opinion. So yeah, we'll we'll, we'll roll through these weeks five hit and misses. We'll have John back tomorrow do our week six preview, and, and all will be right with the world, right? Exactly. Um, so. Mm-hmm. Let's just get it moving. I do want to say congratulations to DJ Moore. I'm just going to come out there and say that. I don't, ah, yeah. don't want to spoil anything that you got you know, written down for the show, but I, I watched it live. I saw him take off, and I'm like, son of a bitch, there he is. So congrats to DJ Moore. You are back. Hey, listen, if you held on long enough, yeah, it was, it was bound to happen. I, I went super bullish on DJ Moore, so I don't even know if I can call that a hit because I went over the top. Or well, DJ Moore, but nonetheless, it was it was nice to see a startable game uh, from from DJ Moore. All things being considered, but yeah, when right before we went live, I said there was for the first time a couple forty hits and misses where I think we we're all in consensus uh, as far as a few calls for the week. And the first one wasn't, I guess, a consensus. I was I was throwing some over unders out there, and uh, it was for David Johnson. How much is he going to touch the ball? for those Houston Texans. And I, I threw the line at 16 at first and both you over, over. <laughs> and I was like, oh, crap. Okay. I guess I was a little light. So I pushed to 20 and John said, Oh, well I would take the over on 16. I'll take the under on 20. You, my friend still went bullish and said, give me the over on that. Oh, he had 17 carries on the game. So my, my original line was almost Vegas precise uh, on there. I just needed to give it that 17 and a half line, but both you guys were, were right. They were going to ride him a little bit. He did not produce the fantasy day. That anyone expected didn't get in the end zone. Deshaun Watson did what I have been saying Deshaun Watson was going to do after that murderer's row early and finally started slinging the rock. It just did not benefit David Johnson that much. I think he only had one or two catches on the day, but pretty spot on as far as the amount of carries he was going to touch. Um, another one was Mike Davis. We were all saying, this is, this is go, go out on top, you know, ride Mike Davis. John went as far as to call him an RB1 on the week. Well, he is the RB1 in PPR with one game to go on Tuesday night, 16 for 89 rushing nine for 60 and one receiving. I mean, the guy just 149 yards with nine receptions and a touchdown on the week. He's, he's been amazing. He's one of the best waiver pickups, especially if you were a McCaffrey owner and you were able to scoop him where it has been a plug and play. Your team has not suffered from losing Christian McCaffrey. If indeed you added Mike Davis, uh, on the waiver wire and he's he's been an absolute beast for three weeks and he's just going to get relegated right back to the bench when Christian McCaffrey comes back right yeah 100 percent agree there um it kind of makes you wonder though you know he was it was in Seattle and he tore it up there for a little bit and then Carson came back and it's like no respect for this guy I think there's got to be a team out there uh maybe hint hint Washington or something like that, that just says, you know what, screw it. We'll pay him for a year and use him as a true bell cow. And, you know, then, you know, I don't know, franchise the guy or something. Cause I think he deserves to be in the NFL for sure. Yeah. He got screwed by uh, Chicago last year too, where they were just forcing David Montgomery in front of him because of the draft capital, where I thought he would get a longer leash uh, to be the primary ball carrier for the bears last year. And he never got, you know, never got a fair shake, but if you're a McCaffrey owner and did not land Mike Davis, I would be trying to trade for him on the cheap as soon as McCaffrey comes back, just to shore that up <laughs> in the event that you lose him again. But if you have him, do not cut him. That is a guy that you need to keep on your bench, especially in, in redraft. There was a notable miss and it was in that, uh, 
in this well, it was in the same game where I was speaking David Johnson, not this game, but we all missed on Brandon Cooks. Brandon Cooks, eight for one sixty one and one. Across the board, we're all like, nope, not doing it. You can fire up Will Fuller, yeah, Deshaun Watson. We think David Johnson gets carries. None of us were willing to even say Will Fuller's a, a flex wide receiver after he put that goose egg up. Well, Will Fuller He's probably vying for wide receiver one on the week with who I don't know, sorry about that. Chase Claypool. We'll have to touch on that a little yeah, bit. So yeah. not wide receiver one of the week. There's a couple of two touchdown guys, but nonetheless, that is a wide receiver one stat line for Brandon Cooks on the week. I sure didn't see it coming after what he experienced the week prior, but we all missed on that one. So we're gonna have to take the L on Brandon Cooks for at least one week and then everyone will start him next week. And you know what he's gonna do? He's gonna disappoint. So (laughs) we'll probably just have to go back to the well in week six, but that was our 40 hits and misses. We were, we were all on the same side of those hits and misses jumping into you. There was a few that it's, it's eerie sometimes when you are just honest on a guy on a situation. And the first (laughs) one that came to mind with me is you are full chase Edmonds. I mean, we've been kind of shitting on Kenyon Drake for a few weeks now and think you went as far as I, it's going to be a timeshare this week and the better player is going to emerge. And then we could see a change in the guard going forward. Well, Edmonds touched the ball eight times, 92 yards and a touchdown just shot out of a cannon while Kenyon Drake is just slogging along, like finally got into the end zone. So he didn't like totally kill you, but it's night and day watching these two running backs uh, in the same backfield. It's like they're, so almost like they're called different. It, it, like the offense changes entirely uh, with these. Yeah. Chase Edmonds is by far the better running back in Arizona right now. It's almost like uh, the longest yard when Adam Sandler pisses off the offensive line, so they just let guys through to sack his ass. Uh, it's kind of maybe Kenyon Drake has you know something's going on in the locker room because it does look like a whole different offense, and uh, it's not just because I'm high on Edmonds and I have him on a bunch of teams. It's just because. Every time the guy touches the ball, you get at least one fantasy point at this point. So, you know, why not ride somebody like that in your flex and uh, enjoy it, reap the benefits? Yeah, yeah. So, so kudos to you because certainly a flex worthy performance, especially in PPR with that five for fifty six receiving. You also said that Mike Kosicki was going to have a big game, and while I think we were all wrong on what the Dolphins were or were not going to do to those 49ers uh, on Sunday, you certainly were right. The, you, I'll take the five for ninety one from a tight end. I mean, the way tight end has been this year is frustrating would be to put it mildly i mean there's literally the haves and the have-nots and the haves are pretty much the big three and then the have-nots are the entire rest of the league you you will take five from 91 you can plug that into any fantasy roster for me right now and i'll I'll accept it auto accept over what my guy could potentially produce for the week so give me that (laughs) 14.1 ppr points from the tight end position yeah it's a tight end wasteland these days yeah, it's touchdown or bust, which was a lot like last year as well. But just the way some guys literally just just ebb and flow week to week where they're a part of the game plan one week and they're a blocker the next week is totally insane. Um, another guy that you would have called would have been a massive hit if it weren't for injury is Keenan Allen. You, you said he was going to have a big night. You actually even referenced that Marcus Lattimore wasn't going to be able to stay with him. Well, unfortunately, a back injury had him out of that game early, but he was setting up. For a day, I mean, he was just showing the the Keenan Allen pass <laughs> pass route shops where he was just open. I mean, Keenan Allen is just always open and would have had a big day because Justin Herbert is not afraid to sling it. They unfortunately lost when they shouldn't have because Money Badger bounces one off of the upright and then Saints come back in overtime to win. But yeah, Keenan Allen would have been set up for an easy hundred yard, possible two touchdown day. If he finished out, it just that all went to to Big Mike Williams to to our buddy John Devari chagrin um, right. on the evening. But I'm considering that a hit because shit, well, that thank was just you. the first first quarter. Yeah, twenty nine hundred touchdowns. Yeah. I was trying to find something late later in the evening, um, you know, about Keenan Allen because I'm concerned. I own him in a lot of spots just for myself, but it doesn't seem too serious. They are on bye next week. Um, and he was smiling, you know, joking around on the sideline when they panned to him. He wasn't in the locker room. So I, I don't know what was going on there. Like, they're like, it's just a jam or I don't know. But I, it looked like to me if it was serious, he would have played like playoff situations. 
Yeah, I, I think I read spasm. I mean, he got hit in the back, so he was just getting spasm because they were trying to stretch him out. And you know, I was I was there with you. I'm watching him smiling on the sidelines. I was like, okay, when's he when's he getting back in there? I own Keenan Allen in a ton of spots. And then the next series, it's not there. And then they showed a sideline. Yeah, and he's he's smiling and joking around with people. I'm like, okay, we're just giving him a series off. And then you get the update for, uh, at halftime that uh, Keenan Allen's ruled out for the game, and it's probably precautionary because of that bye week. Uh, you know, error on the side of caution with that. But yeah, I got to think given given the you know, the, the 14 days between play and he should be, he should be fine. All things being considered, Mike Williams came down a little gimpy on his knee at the end of that game as well. So this yeah. might be a good time for those uh, chargers to get a buy and uh, try and get a little bit healthy because our boy, Justin, a bear should have had a one win under his belt at this point in time. They are losing close game after close game where they're coming out hot and then they just start getting chipped away at, and they can't seem to close the game. So that's unfortunate. They're what? one and four. They could be easily three and two. I, I mean, I'm starting to like these Chargers. No, I'm back. I'm back. You know, yeah. classic Chargers fan. I'm back. I'm loving <laughs> what Herbert's doing. I mean, the kid just doesn't seem to be phased. He's willing to push it down the field. It's just exciting football. When you're watching, conversely, Drew Brees dink and dunk it. You know, I think one ball traveled over 20 air yards, and it was a touchdown to to Jared Cook. Everything else was just underneath quick hit and shit, and that's just boring to me, and it's not – it's not the football I want to watch. So, yes, you have a fan in me, a Justin A. Bear. If if you can't think of any other hits, like I said before we went live, you you nailed a lot of stuff, but a lot of it was you know start this guy, don't start this shot, guy. Yeah. You weren't shot, really shot. weren't no, really putting your nuts nuts out there. Um, I didn't feel like, comfortable with the COVID, like you explained earlier. You know, uh, a lot of uncertainty. Um, I actually am kind of pissed off because I took out uh, John U and they're. Looks like they're gonna play, and uh, Dalton Schultz got me a big point five. So, <laughs> oh yeah, well, listen, we'll we'll we'll, th- we'll we'll transition right to that. Yeah, yeah there we'll, it we'll is. Transition. You said Dalton Schultz was gonna score two touchdowns. That was the one bold call that you that at the end you threw out there. Yeah, he had one catch for six yards in the game, and granted, a lot happened in that game that you know could have affected what Dalton Schultz did or did not do. But um, Dalton to Dalton. Might be a thing <laughs> when it's all said and done, but certainly did not beat up the Giants as you had anticipated. Um, you also said that this was going to be a Naheem Hines week because of the Russian defense of the Browns. It was not. Three for eight rushing, two for 22 receiving. I don't think Naheem's Hines week is a thing anymore. They're just not even throwing to the running backs. After that first week where we were like, holy shit, both of these dudes can catch 80 passes. They've totally stopped throwing it to the running back. None of them since then. It's I, I can't figure it out for the life of me because Rivers can't push it down the field anymore. I would think these running backs would be, be getting peppered with targets, and they're not, and they were coming from behind here. Just totally confused. I understood your rationale and did, couldn't argue it, but seems like the Colts don't want Rivers to be the only thing Rivers can be anymore. And it's this check down short yardage specialist. If they think he's going to continue to push the ball down the field to like T.Y. Hilton and little else, they're going to lose more games than, than they had intended to go in. Yeah, there's I don't I don't get it. Um, it's not a formula for success. If you go back to any of Philip Rivers career games or, you know, seasons, it's always a running back. Danny Woodhead, uh, Eckler. I mean, you can go further and further back. And uh, he loves the running back, but just not in this offense. It just doesn't make sense. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm not going to go out on a limb and say Naheem Hines name anymore, but uh, mm-hmm. definitely going to be on my radar moving forward. Yeah. The two of those, they combined for seven targets in this game. I, I just don't understand it where they were down 20 to 10 at halftime. Uh, it kind of clawed their way back in, in the third, but still it was a game where you just assume that those guys should get a dozen targets split between the two of them. And I don't, that's not even saying a lot, but six targets each. I mean, to have seven total baffling to me. We were talking about that Sunday night. No, sorry, the Monday night football game. These, these schedule changes are throwing me off, but the Monday night game, you also said it was going to be another Latavius Murray game. And at the end of the day, he had 10 touches for 55 yards. He was an efficient backup running back, but that's not what you uh, wanted in your flex position. So um, it's it's unfortunate that the touchdowns went to Drew Brees and Taysom Hill and not to Latavius Mario or Alvin Kamara. So you can't really predict for that. If you'd added that one-yard touchdown to Latavius' stat line instead of Drew Brees', you'd be like, shit, yeah, I'll take 11 for 56 at a touchdown <laughs> for my flex. So 
process might have been right, but unfortunately, except in situations where he plays the Detroit Lions or when Alvin Kamara gets hurt, we may have to temper expectations yep. about Latavius Murray. The Saints offense, just to throw this out here real quick, is, uh, I'm done with it. I'm not going to really uh, trust anybody in there, except for Kamara, obviously. You have to because Drew Brees is literally dumping everything off to him. But other than that, it's a train wreck right now. Yeah, I mean, what Michael Slant Boy Thomas does is exactly what Drew Brees is capable of <laughs> at this point in time, and it's hitting people within the you know within the first down marker, and maybe they do something after it. I mean, that's what he did with Manny Sanders: twelve catches for one hundred and twenty-two yards. They were all a bunch of six to eight yard passes where Manny Sanders got tackled and fell forward for two more yards. And he was just 10 yards here, 10 yards here. I mean, that's just literally all it was. I put out a tweet about Traquan Smith saying he's not built for for this offense. Traquan Smith is this underneathy guy. I mean, Benny Fowler and this guy named Marquez Callaway saw twice the targets that a Traquan Smith did. And it's because Breeze can't or won't push the ball downfield. So adjust accordingly. You're right. But <laughs> Alvin Kamara is still going to see his requisite, you know, eight to 10 targets every uh, single week. <laughs> You know, it'd be funny is that they, that's why they kicked Ted Ginn out of, out of, out of uh, New Orleans. Drew Brees can't throw the ball no more, man. It's bad. Yeah, they don't need him. All right. What else did I miss on? No, that, that's all I had you for, for big misses. Like I said, you, you kind of, you kind of played the middle of the road, called a bunch of correct things. But you know, with these hits or misses, it's more things we were adamant about or things that weren't uh, so chalky. So you had a, you had a, you had a good day. They were a good week last week. You didn't you didn't try and go go too far out of bounds. And even your misses were were reasonable. They sting a little. They yeah, sting. you were calling lower end guys. The Dalton Schultz thing, I think, was more homerism than anything else. And the fact yes, that yes. Dallas typically beats up the Giants for their tight end. But um I'm sure some people started them because as we said, the tight end <laughs> is a wasteland right now and that one point six PPR points. Uh now you, you don't want to look at that twice. So We'll move on to John. John is not here to defend himself. He also didn't really go too bold. And we're going to have to discuss, you know, future shows because either I am far too bold on too many of my calls or you guys are far too conservative. We're going to have to figure out a a finer blend because John also only had a handful, all things being considered. But he said this could be a girly game. He actually called for two touchdowns out of girly. And while he didn't get that second touchdown, Todd Gurley beat those Carolina Panthers up in the run game. When no one else on that Atlanta team did much, 14 carries for 121 yards and a touchdown. Looked, dare I say, vintage girly. But Panthers' run defense is not good, but shit. You will take that game from Todd Gurley. If he had 25 carries, I'll say 30 carries. Give me to 100 yards and a touchdown with Todd Gurley at this point, and I am dancing. He's still barely used in the receiving game. He did get four catches for 29 yards, second on the team, which is somewhat surprising. But there was no Julio, a limited gauge. It was just a, a, another ugly game for those Atlanta Falcons. But i give John the call there on being a girly game. John actually went as far as saying that Mike Davis will be an RB1 again. Like I said, we all hit it. But John threw out he'll be RB1 again. Didn't mean overall, but that would have been the all-time shot of all-time shots. That would have been up there with John's Kareem Hunt fumble call uh, from his rookie year, calling him RB1 overall. But Still, to trust Mike Davis is is worth calling a hit. And then, as far as the Arizona offense was concerned, John said, Kyler Murray is going to force feed the ball to DeAndre Hopkins. And he said that is about the entirety of his uh, analysis of that game. Well, that's exactly what happened. I mean, he just will throw it to Nuke no matter what. He put up a wide receiver one stat line. Kyler put up a QB one stat line. I'm going to call that a hit because outside of that, it was a little ugly other than your boy Chase Edmonds. Yeah, uh, just to touch on Hopkins, um, it was real quiet for the first half especially. Uh, I think it all kind of took place in the third quarter because uh, I stopped looking for receptions for Hopkins. I'm like, what the hell is going on? And then all of a sudden, boom, 100 yards in a touch. So it can happen quick in that offense for sure. Well, there was back-to-back plays where he hit him for like a 40-plus yarder and then a 30-some yard touchdown, literally back-to-back plays on the same defender. So you're right. It was a nondescript day for for Hopkins until he put 70 and a touchdown up on, on a single drive. So, yeah, only seven targets on a day, which is very light for Hopkins. Caught six of them for 131 and a touchdown. Going to some misses. John went bold on Devin Duvernay, and he's he's going to have to pump the brakes on these uh, young <laughs> wide receivers that he just gets enamored with because – 
Duvernay had a beautiful rush, nice 42 yard run, but two for 17 receiving. He's just not, he's not involved in this passing game. This passing game is Mark Andrews, Hollywood Brown, maybe a little bit of Willie Sneed here and there, but there is absolutely no room for Devin Duvernay to get enough targets to be relevant. He is a special teams guy. He's good for stretching the field and keeping teams honest, but he said he was going to lead him in receiving and there was no way that was ever going to happen. So swing and a miss from our boy, John DeBarry. He said he is also staying away from the Miami San Fran game. And I said, is it a hit or a miss? You know, because there was a lot to be had on that Miami side of the field. There was literally nothing outside of Raheem Mostert to be had on the San Fran side. So that was definitely not a stay away game. It was a stay away from San Fran game, and they are they are taking on water right now. I I just do not know what to make of that 49ers team. Brought Jimmy Garoppolo back a little too early. He looked terrible. They had to go back to your boy beat hard. It's it's what's going on in San Fran. I know they got hit by the injury bug, but shit, we know all about the injury bug. No team is above it right now. And this San Fran going back to back losses to my Eagles and to the Miami Dolphins at home. In San Fran, after they were in the Super Bowl a year ago, that is an epic fall from grace. So, uh, side diatribe. I don't know why this is never a narrative. Not to go too far in depth. Uh, I know we're both on a crunch. Is I never thought Jimmy G was franchise quarterback. He's great backup. Uh, not to bash him right here because of the last loss wasn't his fault, but this one definitely is on his hands. And uh, I don't know. Moving forward, he's going to have to have some good weeks or there's going to be some competition in San Francisco for that QB job. And uh, Bihar did go to college with Mr. Kittle, so that's all they need, really. They don't need to give it to any wide receivers. So we could be seeing uh, maybe an Iowa Hawkeye connection moving forward. Ah, uh, Well, those 49ers host the L.A. Rams on Sunday Night Football next week. So that is a absolute must win coming off of these back-to-back losses. And they're getting a nice string of home games here. So the 49ers are going to be on the road, it seems like, quite a bit. If we're seeing back-to-back-to-back home games for those 49ers. I know they had this trip stay on the East Coast for two weeks prior to that, so maybe this is doing them a solid. But that's no sure thing uh, against the Rams. And if Jimmy G's still immobile, you know, still still using that ankle injury, whew, we saw what Aaron Donald did <laughs> on Sunday. He is going to be coming for that immobile Jimmy G on Sunday Night Football. So, yeah, let's uh, let's keep an eye on that. The last thing from John was he, again, these young receivers that John is just enamored with, Darius Slayton, two-touchdown game. Now, listen, Darius Slayton very much had a startable game. I was on Darius Slayton as well. We were talking about that defense. Well, Darius Slayton wasn't able to score a touchdown because somehow in a game where the Giants scored 34 points, against your Dallas Cowboys, and this is by no means trying to rub it in. Daniel Jones did not throw for a single touchdown. I, I, It's still lost on me. Evan Ingram gets a rushing touchdown. Devonta Freeman gets a rushing touchdown. They get a defensive touchdown. It, anything but Daniel Jones, who just plummeted all of my DFS builds because he was so cheap. I put him with Slayton in a ton of places, and somehow he brings nothing to the table in a game where 34 points are scored. So I'm just more upset about that. Then really, John missed it on the two-touchdown call by Darius Slayton because very much startable, but zero TD. So we're going to have to give him a mess on that one. Yeah, I'm I'm with it. <laughs> Especially against the Cowboys. We could, we could count that one. All right, so we're going to move on to me, and I'll just rapid fire mine a little bit more. As stated, I, I, I'm i going to have to start reeling myself back in a little bit. I'm, I'm getting a, a little too just- aggressive. You're also a little too critical of yourself, too. Yeah, oh, right. listen, the, the, the misses were misses, but they, they weren't these epic misses. But I, I'll, I'm going to take a couple of my hits. I, I guaranteed Hollywood Brown touchdown. He chucked that. He checked that box pretty early. Six for 71 and a touchdown. So we got that dance out of the way for him. I said randomly. So we, we're going IDP nugget here, which we rarely ever do. I said Aaron Donald's going to get three sacks in the game. I don't even know why I said it. I just said New Cal Allen stunk. And so he was just going to be under siege. Well, I was actually wrong about that because Aaron Donald had four sacks on the day. <laughs> but there was another guy on that team at three. So a spot on that sacks were going to be had by those LA Rams. I literally said that Josh Jacobs was going to have 25 touches and produce an RB1 stat line. Josh Jacobs had 25 touches exactly for 85 yards and two touchdowns for an RB1 stat line. That's what they wanted to do. Even though he wasn't overly successful on the ground, I knew they were going to run him. 
And then they beat them over the top with your boy Henry Ruggs as well to hand them Chiefs a loss. That's a hit. I forgot about that. I think I even mentioned Ruggs again. You guys both clowned me. <laughs> it, I, we'll, we'll have to check the tapes. I think you might have pulled back after after <laughs> put, put your name on the line on him for a couple of weeks. But Christ, he, he's that element. He's what. That's why they drafted him. They said they kept seeing what Tyreek Hill was doing to them year after year and breaking their coverage. And they said, we want that. And you, you know, that's the right way. We will draft speed. But the fact that Carr was willing to push the ball downfield, I think is what my concern has always been with players like Ruggs on that team is it's just not what Carr does. So I think Gruden got in his ass and was like, literally, you better start pushing this ball downfield where people are just going to start pressing us, pressing us, pressing us in this offense. It's going to get uglier and uglier, and you cannot throw it to Darren Waller every single play. So that was a Josh Jacobs hit. I did say it's a James Conner letdown game with my Eagles in their defense. He got a lucky TD late. He had a shitty day. He looked bad. Is there a luckier guy, man? I'm just sick of it. <laughs> yeah, just not. I was like, oh, yeah, that's going to spare him. So you can't really just say, I told you so, because at the end of the day, it's good enough, but just doesn't look special to me. I mean, it, and he's, whether it's injury or whatever, he's going to lose touches down the stretch. Now, they did not go to Anthony McFarland, which I said might have been like a sneaky under the radar, like maybe get this guy a week early. He They didn't touch the ball at all, and that's probably just because Chase Claypool was just running past my entire defense play after play after play for four touchdowns. But no one called that, so we'll just – We'll, we'll admit that from the, the radar. I did say that DJ Moore was going for 102 touchdowns. He only had four for 93 in the touchdown. But still, I'm proud of my boy DJ Moore for finally getting in the end zone. You 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 recollected watching it and saying, okay, yeah, about time. He, he exploded up that sideline. It was a nice day for DJ Moore. I said go back to the well with Robbie Anderson. Okay, he's a must start at this point in time. Eight for 112. From Robbie Anderson. I mean, it's just a two-man offense. Interested to see kind of what comes of things when CMC comes back because I do still think more t- more targets are going to go his way than Mike Davis. But Robbie Anderson is bona fide starter until further notice. I mean, just lock him in if you had him. You got him cheap and good for you. I also yeah. went with it. Go ahead. I was just going to say, hell of a one-handed catch too on the sideline. Uh, I really like what I'm seeing from Robbie. Yeah. Listen, Matt Rule loves him some Robbie Anderson. Yeah, and he's he it's 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 odd. He's running the underneath stuff. DJ Moore's running the deep stuff. If you asked a hundred people on Twitter, ninety nine of them would say the opposite. Like there might be the one guy that's like, ah, maybe not. Like, but it's they're being used. They flipped the script for these two guys. So had I known that ahead of time, I might have been slightly less bullish on DJ Moore. I still think he's uber talented, but. I thought he was getting the volume. I thought DJ Moore was the guy every single week is going to get eight to 10 catches. Like I just just thought that was going to be his role in this offense. And it is not. I said, this is a start Todd Gurley game solely because they were playing the Panthers. It was a Todd Gurley game. I would also highly advise trying to flip him in redraft, even trying to flip him in dynasty because he's still only on a one-year deal. Who even knows what that's, situation is going to look like because I also called that Dan Quinn was going to lose this game and be fired after it. Don't like seeing anyone get fired from their jobs, but this was a long time coming. This franchise has gone in the wrong direction since that Super Bowl loss, and they needed to clear the deck, especially Thomas DeBetroff, because that dude has been getting away with murder for years now, and I'm excited to see what the change looks like in Atlanta. So nailed the Dan Quinn thing as well. I said sound the alarm on Kenyon Drake before this, not so much the timeshare. Just I just wasn't liking his production nor this offense. And yeah, he got a touchdown. But if someone's buying that he's turning a corner, I'm probably willing to sell Kenyon Drake at this point in time. Whether it be a Chase Edmonds issue or just the fact that Kenyon Drake's just really not that good. Uh like he he should be a timeshare back, shouldn't be a bell cow. I just don't think he's an RB1. I, I said it going into the year. He would not be an RB1 for me, but he might not be an RB2 when this thing's all said and done. So kudos to you on the Chase Edmonds side of the house. I just think it's not Kenyon Drake. I said Jamison Crowder was going to see 10 catches in this game. Eh, little off. Eight for 116 and one. Jamison Crowder is, he's there with Robbie Anderson, a guy you got late that is just don't even second guess it. If he's active, he better be in your starting lineup, especially in PPR leagues. He just looks so good in this offense and it's not all this underneath shit he just looks like he's on a mission right now so i'm big fan of my boy jameson crowder 
this one might have been a layout, but I said Sitmo Alley Cox. I, that was a that was an unfortunate blip on the radar. Once Trey Burton came back, Mo Alley Cox got relegated. He's just not seeing the snaps or the targets. So hopefully he got a couple wins during the the Mac attack three week stretch. But you could probably cut him. Go speculate on someone else at this point in time. I said I was scared of Jonathan Taylor going into the week. He had a very James Conner ish type day where if it weren't for that touchdown. You're left unsatisfied. Didn't get the volume. Only had 12 carries. Good yards for carry. Put up 57 yards. Just they weren't running the ball. Weren't being able to establish to run. Two for 17 receiving. Just Christ. 14 touches. 14 touches. It wasn't. It, I, I don't know. I don't know what to do anymore. Like his number should always start with a two. Every single week, his stat line at the end should start two and then something after it. I don't know what that number is, but they're just not using him enough in all facets of the game, and it's just frustrating. Called for a heavy Zeke game even before the injury. He did get those 20 carries. I said he will touch. He will get 20 carries. He will see less targets in this game. Granted, game script might have impacted it slightly, but he had exactly 20 carries, and he had one catch uh, on the day. I think that's more in line with what you should expect to see from Zeke going forward, um, especially mm-hmm. with Andy Dalton under center. He's not catching five, six, seven balls anymore. I, I don't believe so, but he's going to he's going to have 20 carries every single week. You got Kellen Moore out here trying to play mind games in this press conference yesterday saying, oh, uh, we're, we're still going to air it out because we got all these receivers. Nothing's going to change. But, uh, you know, just like you said, a lot's going to change. It's time to run the offense through Zeke like it used to be. And even with a banged up line, it's going to be fine. Yep. Yeah. So that uh, I want to say all is right in the world, but they will be trending back towards being a Zeke focused offense. So Zeke owners should be. Should not be scared uh, in the situation. And Andy Dalton isn't going to be stealing any of these goal line touchdowns either. So you, you might see an uptick uh, in Zeke touches for, uh, for the remainder of the season because he's getting all that he can handle and more. In that same game, I did say start Evan Ingram and Darius Slayton. Luckily, Evan Ingram had a rushing touchdown because he still sucks as a tight end with one catch for 16 yards. But listen, I said tight, tight ends get touchdowns. You're happy. Well, he got a rushing touchdown, so be happy with it. And Darius Slayton, as mentioned, eight for 129, had a big old day, just didn't get in the end zone. The Sunday night football game, I thought it was going to be, as I said, a run fest. And I said, these teams will combine for 60 carries in the game. Well, they had 57 carries between the two teams uh, at the end of the day. And it was for 325 yards and two touchdowns. So the rushing was there. It just really wasn't on the Seahawks side. It was mostly Russell Wilson scrambling late in the game. They didn't give Carson a volume. I thought they sure as shit ran the ball on the, on the Viking side of the house where after Dalvin Cook goes out with his 17 carries, they find a way to give almost 20 second half carries alone to Alexander Madison, who looked amazing, by the way. <laughs> if he had shot out of a cat and healthy, I already saw that it looks like Cook is going to at least miss this upcoming week against the Atlanta Falcons defense, Alexander Madison, week six preview, will be an RB1 <laughs> this week going in. But there was more points scored than I thought, but it was the run fest that, that I had envisioned. It was just heavy on that Viking side of the house. I also said that Justin Herbert was going to push the ball downfield and please start throwing touchdowns to the Alphas. Well, he did. He went to Keenan Allen, Hunter Henry, Mike Williams. That's who got all the touchdowns in this game. That's who should get all the touchdowns until Eckler comes back for those Chargers. So kudos to Justin Herbert. I also said if Mike Williams plays, you start him. Wouldn't have had the day that he ended up having if it weren't for Keenan Allen, but shit, he had 102 touchdowns. Maybe he's the bold call that I should have made for a double touchdown because Herbert and Mike Williams is going to be a thing, and John is just going to have to just eat it for like the next five to seven years of me bringing Mike Williams' name up. <laughs> endless dives to him because he fits what Justin Herbert wants to do. I said Hunter Henry TD, Hunter Henry TD. I'm also going to call close enough. I said Justin Jackson will be a top 18 PPR back. As of right now, he's RB 21 in PPR. I just knew they weren't going to give Joshua Kelly the lion's share of this work after I called the two fumbles in back-to-back weeks. Anthony Lynn just isn't going to stand for that. Joshua Jack, Josh, uh, Justin Jackson was the 1A and Kelly was the clear 1B in this offense. So that will persist because Jackson didn't do anything to lose that. And no, so he looked good. Looked back. He looked yeah, real good. He did. And he's, he's a plus pass catcher as well. He's he's going to get the opportunity. He had 20 touches in the game. So, you know, sat, they are on by. 
So can't start him next week. But Justin Jackson is high end flex until Austin, Austin Eckler comes back. Now we get to my misses because why not finish on a low note? I said Joe Barrow was going to throw three hundred two and three. Oh, well, well, Mister Joe Barrow put up a sparkling one eighty three zero and one line. I mean, just could not get anything going. Didn't throw, didn't throw the picks I thought he was going to throw. So I only threw one. It did. It, I think it did get housed. They did have a defensive touchdown. I think it was on the interception, but just could not move the ball on offense. Joe Barrow let down day. Did you see AJ Green? Did you see that little clip that's floating around? Yeah, he already said something about if you're not going to use me, then trade me. I think is what people are saying. He, he's lip lip reading. And then and then when he did throw that pick right next to AJ Green, he just stood oh, there. Totally, yeah, <laughs> totally just walked it. Totally walked it off. Yeah, he wants nothing to do with that franchise. He didn't want the franchise tag. He wanted one last long term deal after all he's been through with the Bengals. He wants out. It's blatantly obvious. He, there's no way he wasn't going to sign the franchise tag with that guaranteed money. But he wants out of Cincy. Just let him go. They don't. He's not even a part of that offense anymore. I mean, it, it's run through Boyd and Higgins. And grant him his wish. Get something in return for AJ Green. Send him to a contender. Philly. Okay. Sign me up. I, I will take <laughs> a 75% AJ Green to this <laughs> this offense right now. I said, and listen, I am. I've never been so happy to be wrong. I said Alex Smith is never playing a snap of professional football. I just after the new out, but yep, comeback player of the year. Just to hand him the hardware right now. After all that dude has been through, I am such a fan. I just didn't think they were ever really going to put him out there in front of live fire. And from what that Rams front was doing, it might have been the worst scenario to throw him into. Right. <laughs> And luckily, he came out unscathed from it. I just don't. It's got to be a confident booster if they do have to use him moving forward. The crazy thing was is I, I caught that on Red Zone, and they panned to his wife and kids in the stands. And it's just a, it's a huge moment for their family and uh, for Alex Smith. So that's probably one of the better stories we'll see in, in years to come, honestly. Uh, just, just awesome. 100%. I am the biggest fan. It was great that his family was there to see it, that – Nothing tragic happened in, in the game from him coming back. Maybe he built from it. Keep proving me wrong, Alex Smith. Regardless, that Washington football team offense is dreadful. And who would have thought benching Haskins for, for anyone else was going to be the epic downgrade that it was because it killed everyone in that offense, including Antonio Gibson, who I said will give you another RB one week. He did not because, damn, damn. Couldn't get anything moving. They weren't even using them in a passing game as they had in weeks prior. Just ugly, ugly football from the football team. So double loss uh, on that one. I called a two TD guarantee for Clyde Edwards Hilaire. KC had two rushing touchdowns. They just did not go to Clyde Edwards Hilaire. So it is there. He's getting still the rushing share. He, I'm not worried about his usage. His time's going to come, but definitely a miss on that. You and I were both a little bullish. I could call this a miss from you, but I just think you jumped on the back with me. Is I called the Ebron touchdown guarantee. And I, I, wanted, said I wanted it to be right. I said he's streaking, and I just wrote I picked the wrong Steelers tight end because all those touchdowns went to Chase Claypool, who <laughs> still will be called a tight end in my from my mouth until further notice. Because from what I saw, and I didn't see the game live, I was out with the family, so I already knew the outcome. So I didn't subject myself to the torture. It looked like a lot of Claypool was beating up the middle of our defense, which is where Eric Ebron would have been beating Nate Gary up. And the one touchdown that Claypool had was just Gary totally quitting <laughs> on a defensive route and letting Claypool score a touchdown. Just free, just, nah, you're too big, you're too fast, you're too strong. Keep running, son. End zones that way. I hope Nate Gary gets – I hope he gets Dan Quinn uh, sometime this week from the Eagles because he is dreadful and anyone can abuse him. And that's the same thing that George Kittle did the week prior. So right. if you're playing against the Eagles and there's a big, fast guy, get him in your lineup. That's 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 the new rule. It might not have to be a tight end. If there's a big, fast guy. Which makes everyone no freaking knows, sense. I mean, everyone knows how to beat up the Eagles. Stands stands out on the field. It's not like he's going hidden. He's not Darren Sproles, you know. He's not yep. miniature. So, uh, yeah, definitely some problems there. 
I also think there was a little bit of Deontay Johnson out. Chase ah, Claypool happening. That would not have happened. I don't. Chase Claypool would not have happened otherwise because he just wouldn't have seen the snaps. But you can't put the genie back in the bottle now, right? I mean, this nope. dude just – he's been super productive on limited opportunity. Like, interested to see what this means. I mean, Juju's already been relegated. He just – they they're they're clearly moving on from Juju. It's already been discussed that they weren't discussing a new contract. This is last year. They're moving on. It's going to be Deontay Johnson and Chase Claypool and James Washington as their three wide receiver sets in 2021. Juju will be playing elsewhere. and Probably Philly as well. Yeah, that's fine. You know, you know, you know, what, you know what's crazy is it's it's they keep they do like, we've talked about it before. Pittsburgh does such a good job drafting wide receivers. Why do they want to pay Juju Juju money? Honestly, it's, it's it just makes it. I think it doesn't make much sense. So he'll get paid elsewhere and get a good yeah. deal. Listen, we you saw it with Manny Sanders, you saw it with Mike Wallace. I mean, Antonio Brown hung around for a very long time because he was literally the elite of the elite. And they dealt with a lot of shit, sounds like, behind the scenes to, to keep that dude around. But you're right. They rarely want to pay these guys because they know that they have a track record of success of identifying and developing these guys. So next up seems to be Chase Claypool, much to the fantasy 40 chagrin because none of us were fans of this dude coming out of Notre Dame. Thought he just wasn't going to be able to win on the boundary and until they made him a tight end. But maybe they just big slot him and he just dominates like Marcus Colson did, but way faster. So... Might have to admit defeat on the Chase Claypool thing a little early on. Um, speaking of big, fast guys, I said George Kittle was going to be tight end one overall again, and he was going to beat up the Dolphins. No, he didn't. He had four for 44. It just That whole game plan fell apart. So, But a loss is a loss. I also said, Jarek McKinnon, you can start him again. I didn't think Raheem Moser was playing. I honestly didn't. I thought he was going to be a week away. Well, Raheem, same, Moser looked, same. Raheem Moser looked great. So McKinnon had the chance to be great, but that game got – away from them so quick that they probably said, let's just spare him the the useless <laughs> hits and uh, get ready for that Rams game, which is a must win. But still, a miss is a miss. I have, I said I'm happy to be wrong on Preston Williams as well because I didn't think there was much to trust with that Dolphins offense. Well, they start finally started trusting him down the field with deep targets, and he put four for 106 and a touchdown on the ledger against the the 49ers. It was really good to see. I, I love Preston Williams. My deep sleeper to close this out was Darnell Mooney on Thursday Night Football, 100 and a touchdown. Well, he had two for 15. Foles missed him on what could have been a 50-yard touchdown where he had busted the coverage. Some people say it was Foles' fault. Some people say it was Mooney. You know I'm going to say it was Foles' fault because I wanted Mooney to catch it. So Foles did throw where it was supposed to. If he would have let him, Mooney would have walked in, would have ended up with about 70, 80 and a touchdown. I would have looked like a genius. Instead, I look like the guy that said the deep play is Darnell Mooney had two catches for 15 yards. It's all right. It was kind of a rough week overall, you know, not just for the 40. Uh, we, we had some success, uh, all of us, but <clears throat> with the uncertainty and then as we record this, we're still one more game left in uh, good old week five. So, you know, it's 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 definitely a little odd. Yeah, we didn't discuss that Buffalo Tennessee game at length because it was in debate. So I even skipped past. I think we just went very surfacey. Like clearly, you want to start Josh Allen, and you need to start Derrick Henry, and you're going to start Stephon Diggs. But I don't, I don't know. We were going to go too, too deep and wide. It does sound like AJ Brown will be back in action, which will be good to say. It'll make for a better game at the end of the day. Because if not, there would have been no Corey Davis, no Adam Humphreys, no AJ Brown. Just imagine how many targets John O. Smith would have seen. <laughs> it was like 20 targets in the game if it were for AJ Brown coming back. Shit, he still might see 10. I yes. love John Smith. That's probably the only reason I'm going to watch this game tonight. Same here. Well, that was our week five hits and misses. Um, stay tuned. We're going to have the week six preview coming out right after that, one right after another. Boom, boom. And, uh, you know, take some advice. Usually, I'd say right now our percentage is about 86% of the stuff we say is about true, you know, uh, and that's not including our chalk take. So, you know, you can't you can't win them all, but we win the important ones. So uh, you got anything to add before we shut it down? Listen, I'll take 86%. You know, we, we strive to be perfect, but, you know, that's a, that's, a, that's a strong percentage at the end of the day. And I agree, you know, listening back to these, which I had never done before. We used to release and move on to actually go back and listen to the things we said were going to happen. Like one or two things usually stick out. Like, yeah, I remember I was all over that one. But to actually listen and see how pretty consistent we are, 
It's good. It's good for the 40. We are flexing our chests for myself, Andrew Burke, and the one and only Matt Walker. We'll see John tomorrow. We are the Fantasy 40, and we are signing off. Oh! All right. That was pretty clean. All right. End this thing.